So welcome everyone for joining us today from across Victoria. One of the benefits of having a virtual classroom. For those who um, came last week, you'll know the way it works, or two weeks ago now. But just to let everybody know that we are recording this webinar today. So what you say or what you type will be recorded. Um, for everyone who hasn't joined in on a webinar, we all have different levels of bandwidth. So could I please ask you to mute your microphone and during the presentation, turn off your video. Later in the webinar, we'll be asking for your contribution and we'd love you to either talk and turn on your video if you're going to ask a question or simply use the chat box, which I'll go through with you. So if you haven't used this platform before, if you move your mouse down to the bottom three quarters, there'll be a bar at the bottom of the screen. So there will be a little video camera, there will be a little microphone, they should be off, which I think you've all figured out. And there should be a little hand that sometimes isn't. Um, if you push the hand, it means that you'd like to ask a question. If you want to write a question, there's a little talking balloon and some people don't have that either. But um, if you do have the balloon, it's called a chat box. And if you put that, then a side screen will show up and you can type questions in the sidebar. So we'll try and answer them, um, answer some questions and find out where people are from after the screening of the video. If all else fails and you do want to contribute to this, please send me an email and I'll have that open so we can address it online. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting in the Golden Broken, the people of the Yorta Yorta and the Tangarong Nation as well as the Indigenous people of the lands you are joining in from. The From the Ground Up project is funded from the Australian Government National Land Care Program, and we have three years remaining of this funding cycle. Today, we are hosting the second of a series of three virtual farm walks and talks, focusing on how our farming landscapes can be modified to manage climate risks and what we need to morph, adapt or change in order to manage climate risks on our properties. We are joined today by Serenity Hill, the farmer whose property you'll be viewing shortly, and she will be available afterwards to answer questions about her property for those who would like to know something a bit more specific. So please hold tight while I share my screen with you so that you're able to see the start of the video presentation of Serenity and her farm. Just to Warning, the video has about a five, 15 second slide at the beginning where there's no audio. So um, just remember that it will come on. Thank you. For those who've just joined us, if you could just turn off your video and your microphone and that will help us with bandwidth and make sure that everybody has access. So if you're not sure where that is, there's a band about three quarters of the way down your screen with a video sign. And if you press that, you can turn off your video. Next to it is a microphone sign. And then there's a hand and a conversation bu bubble. All right, I'm just going to share my screen now. And... Here we go. Just remember the 15 seconds. Thank you. Firstly, Serenity, tell us a little bit about where you live, the size of your farm, the enterprise, bit of the, you know, is there a bit of geology that you know about this region? So we're in Warren Bay, which is just south of Benalla. And we currently lease this farm from mum. We've had it for the last couple of years, but it's been in the family for a long time. We're going through a succession process. It's about 400 acres, 168 hectares. Um, and we run meat sheep. We've got Aussie whites, yep. um, which we sell directly. Uh, and we're just starting on this farming game. And uh, the soil type here, what's that uh, predominantly? Uh, the, there's two different, the, we've got sort of grey soils and um, uh, red soils, so there's two different sort of parts of the um, farm, but it's granite, granite country, yeah. What's the history of the property? So 
I'd like yeah. to get a bit of a picture of, you said you've been here in the family for a long time. So I'd like to get a little bit of picture of, you know, what's changed over time, particularly in relationship to climate change. Has there been things that have dried up? Have you planted more trees? Have you, what yeah. sort of is the property history? Yeah. So it's been sort of in the family for a hundred years, um, this particular property and my um, grandparents uh, ran sheep. So it's been, my, my parents had sort of cattle and sheep, but this was always the sheep property. Uh, and over time, my parents were involved in land care right from the very, very start, like the very before even land care was a brand. <laughs> um, so there's, you can see the history of this uh, farm in the history of land care as well with the early plantations and the patterns on kind of tops of hills. And then, you know, when we went through all, all the different yeah. stages and yeah. there's, there was farm forestry experimentation. So a lot of the trees on the farm are actually in that sort of 40 year period sort of planted. Yeah. Um, over that time, which is an amazing kind of thing for us to move on to. We're not mm. sort of starting from mm. um, scratch. Uh, and I suppose in terms of climate, the rainfall um, has dropped and the rainfall has become much more unpredictable. And so we're getting more kind of summer rain and less rain in the winter, um, like big bursts of sort of summer rain. And, and it's, yeah, it's more about the, the unpredictability. Is there anything that you've changed over um, the last couple of years that you've been farming that has helped to address climate change issues? So, uh, yeah, we've only sort of been leasing the property for a couple of years for my mum. So we're working on a great base of what my parents um, have already done in terms of 40 years of kind of tree planting as well as maintaining the native grass pasture mm -hmm. but we've um, come in and we're sort of implementing more of a, a regenerative grazing regime so we're um, uh, managing the animals at the moment with temporary fencing but we've got a plan for many many more paddocks to be able to have that tighter management of the grazing for longer rest periods which will really boost um, the native uh, perennial pastures more and what we're trying to do is and we will be getting more trees in the landscape um, particularly for shade, and we'll be catching more water um, into dams. So they're kind of our big three things in terms of the bigger plan for the farm. It's the catching more water in the soil and the dams, doing the, the through the regenerative grazing, and then getting more trees, um, particularly paddock trees for the shade. Um, because in summer doing that tighter grazing, um, shelter is a big kind of constraint. Um, yeah, so we're sort of in this transition period and we've got kind of big plans. Um, but yeah, the biggest thing we've implemented is that new regenerative grazing patterns. Yeah. So Serenity, I'd like to pick up a little bit on the fact that your your succession into the farming, um, yeah. into the farm, it's it sounds like it's been a very easy process for you um, to come into the farm but um, how was that succession plan in, plan and planning going? Yeah so um, succession takes a kind of long time. Uh, my mum was really happy that we wanted to come in and look after the land so um, she's kind of excited about our plans a little bit you know interested to see how we're going to go but there's been a lot of lead time in that planning and we've at the moment we're leasing and we have been for the, next, the last couple of years and until we get the kind of trust in place and all the, the things in place um, that'll be our kind of um, our sort of trialed and transition kind of period and we you know invested in really good advice from lawyers and accountants um, and you know working out how mum can get a pen. It's very quite complicated and you need to get good advice and you need to allow time. Um, and my siblings are also really um, supportive of what we're trying to do, yeah. So you've been on the farm now for two years. How how many years before that was, uh, were you in the planning stages? Probably uh, three years, yeah. Probably it's been like five years of kind of uh, talking and building up to it, yeah. yeah. Yes, we've inherited, um, an appreciation of the kind of environment and and um and doing things in a more kind of environmental way but i think we're going one step further in terms of this um the regenerative grazing um practices because it's quite it's taking a bit of a jump so you talk a lot about regenerative um grazing serenity what is that the main thing that you're doing on your property to combat things like climate change 
uh, it's one of the things, and part of that is about being able to capture more of the water runoff in the um, soil. We're also doing um, catching more water in our dams, and we're also um, establishing trees um, yet yeah, for the for the stock. But yeah, regenerative grazing is a it's kind of a low input system, so it's also managing some of the other risks. So kind of managing our climate risk, but also um, the costs of farming. Um, and so that that is there's a whole reason lots of reasons why we're kind of doing it and what it involves is basically managing the animals in in one mob and having much more control over the grazing so we're leaving much longer rest periods and enabling the um, perennial grassland to uh, flourish and do its own kind of nutrient cycling so there has been some challenges in transitioning to more of that regenerative grazing, um, particularly establishing new infrastructure, like getting lots of small paddocks. At the moment, for part of the property, we're doing temporary fencing, but that is a short term thing until we get the, the more permanent kind of fencing um, in place. And I think that that is quite a big barrier to people moving to regen regenerative grazing. There are, there are quite a, a lot of barriers actually. Um, and I think people will um, move to it in bigger numbers when we have higher input prices and if, if commodity prices come back um, and people are looking for a, a low risk kind of low input um, system so yep. yeah so i noticed that you've got um, your uh, portable electric fence three -wide system yes. is that how you're managing the grazing at the minute for part of the property um we're doing it that way but that's a kind of short term uh until we get more permanent kind of fences and uh permanent water kind of in place which we're doing iteratively across the property uh, i think for people uh we, we've got sheep at the moment um meat sheep we would like to have cattle but it's really hard to get into cattle at the moment because it's expensive um i think it's lower barrier for people starting regenerative grazing with cattle particularly if you've got secure water supply good water supply because you can manage it with one wire electric fence which is in terms of labor intensity much lower so there are all these little things that you really need to understand in terms of like the labour versus capital cost of transitioning to regenerative ag. Yeah. And you're talking about capturing water in dams. We can see a dam behind you now. Uh, what are you doing to, to do that? How are you capturing more water in yeah. dams? So we've got um, one dam that's a spring fed dam and another major dam on different parts of the property. And we're doing kind of a combination of um, diversion banks and raising the capacity a little bit um and then then from the main spring dam with an increased capacity we also we can pump it to the highest point of the property and feed it out through troughs yep. so we've got um putting the water where we can kind of control it and and use it more but it's also yeah using some combination of, of diversion banks along our kind of um laneways and ac new plan for access tracks yeah some of these are Damara Aussie White Cross and some are pure Aussie Whites and we're moving across to pure Aussie Whites. And the reason why we, there's a few reasons why we chose that breed. They're really um, kind of hardy and resilient. Uh, the meat is really good. They have like a marbling, um, kind of like Wagyu. And the, the lambs mature really fast. So you can sort of have lambs off after kind of six or seven months. Uh, and they're also unseasonal in their breeding. So we've got more flexibility. We may eventually be able to move to um, joining them every eight months, um, which is something that, you know, you can't do with merinos or, or breeds that are a bit more um, seasonal. And also they're a shedding breed, so we don't need to worry about uh, wool. And in general, they're good um, browsers and they eat a, a diverse um, variety of things as well. They're good in a kind of regenerative system, yeah. Just wait and I'll stop sharing my screen. Welcome back everyone. Um, so now is the opportunity to ask Serenity some questions um, or if you would like to um, contribute to the conversation, I'm, I'm really curious about what other people are doing on their properties to combat 
climate change as well. So um, now is the time. So I might ask Serenity to come back and share her video with us. And I'll just introduce everyone to Serenity. Hi, Serenity. Thanks for joining Hi. us today. Thanks. Does anybody, I'll open it up to anybody for questions. You can either type them. Yes, we've got one here. If, do you want to, Susie Bate? Yeah. Do you want to show you? Yep. Hi. Um, I don't have a chat box. I, I have to, you have to listen to me, I'm afraid. That's okay. Um, Serenity, I have heard you speak once before, but I'm, just a question. Have you had advice on where you're looking to put your permanent fencing? Is that something you have worked out yourself or is that something you're mm. getting involved? Um, because we're, we're down in Loxley, so in between. Yeah. Yeah. And, Loxley, yeah. yeah. So, and, and we're sort of just into, I've done the holistic management course and a few things, but um, we've sort of, you know, fencing's a big expense and, and we've got Merino used fat lambs. It's just not, not that simple to use temporary fencing. Yeah, I know. Uh, and we don't want to just go, oh, well, we'll stick the fence there because the trough's there and the dam's there if mm. it's not necessarily the right place. Yeah, we, uh, it, it's really quite tricky. So we've, we've, we've done our sort of whole farm plan where we've started with the water and where the kind of diversion banks are going to be and where the kind of access um tracks are and then from there we want to leave as many of the existing fences as possible but we'll have to take some down and add some so it, it has and we, the reason why we haven't put any fences up yet I actually bought the fencing material a while ago it's like for this exact reason like it's quite complex when you're going to do it once like doing it properly and yeah you have to start with the water so um a really good a really good resource is um, da Darren Doherty's Regrarian stuff and the um, handbook he's put out recently, which starts with this um, uh, um, levels of kind of permanence and starting with the with the landform and the water and kind of working back from that. And I think the fences are the third thing. And the fencing that we have ended up that we'll be putting in as permanent is a Western fence, which is a Gallagher product, and we'll put in four wire electric. And then later on, you can kind of retrofit that to permanent non-electric um, without taking the fences down and putting other ones up again. So, yeah. Thanks, Susie. Did that help answer your question? Uh, yep, Dan Doherty, was that? Darren. Uh, Darren. Darren. Just Google regrarians. And I'll, I'll grab that afterwards and put it in an email to everyone uh, yeah. for after the session. Yeah. So... How, how does that suit, Susie? Yep, terrific. Thank you. No worries. We have a question from Tom. Uh, how many sheep are you farming and yeah. what size paddocks are you aiming for? That's a good question, Tom. Yeah, yeah. So we're aiming for, so um, it's 400 acres and we're aiming for about 100 paddocks, so four acres each. But to start off, we sort of, that'll be iterative till we um, eventually get to that. And look, I'm eventually wanting like about to run about 500 of the self-replacing um, Aussie whites, but we've only got 100 at the minute. So it's not um, yet yeah, we're taking time to build up. So it's not really representative at the moment, but that's what I'm kind of aiming for um, or a bit less and to also use cattle. So, yeah. Did that help, Tom? Did you want to say anything else about that? Yeah, I'm just wondering if... Um Thank you. And wondering how many uh, you're aiming for with those four acre paddocks, how will you be just monitoring the grass for how long you keep them in there or you aim for every two days you're moving them? Is there, have you got a plan behind that? Um, yeah, we, so I would recommend people doing the regenerative grazing course with Graham Hand and Colin Sice. That's what we did. Um, we're also working, so we've got a share farming thing going um, with someone who actually manages the day-to-day -day kind of grazing, but it's very, it changes all the time. So it's about what's left for the, the, the yeah, it's, it's, it's really different. So we, um, so we're moving on to the paddock that has had the most um, 
rest basically um and and just yeah moving them on when they need to move on so you get yeah i would recommend doing the regenerative grazing course thanks very much yeah thanks tom um and i can send out some information on the next holistic management and i think in the following year 2021 22 we'll be running some regenerative ag grazing courses hopefully as well so we'll just keep you updated with that serenity ron harris has a question um what yeah. evidence pers persuaded you to go down the regenerative ag path rather than the best practice management of perennial pastures uh best practice management of perennial pastures so i do you want to give me more information about what that is so ron uh if you press your mic would you like to talk to that so best practice management of perennial pastures would be resting perennials or uh, not grazing phalaris until the three leaf stage or whatever it may be serenity like yeah. the regenerative ag it's very expensive in the fencing you've outlined that yeah. and i'm not clear what the benefits are so we don't want to use any inputs at all so to be able to so to, for to to enable the nutrient cycling to happen on its own the roots have to get right down so we we're, we're managing to like the fourth leaf and um and a, a, managing so that there's full recovery of the grasses so that um we're not putting on any fertilizer at all so you kind of yeah i've also been driven by a broader you know, I, I think that w I want to have a role in climate mitigation. Um, I, I don't think that we can just be adapting to climate change. So I want to be actively part of reducing fertiliser use um, as well as sequestering carbon in soils and vegetation as well as, you know, trying to make a living from that. So I've got a few different motivations going on other than just um, selling meat. Thanks, Serenity. We might leave that one there, Ron, um, and I'm sure that afterwards, because we've got a few more questions to work through, but appreciate that, that question, Ron. Um, so Lindy has asked a couple of questions, actually. Um, thank you, Serenity, for sharing your story so far. Susie asked my question. So what are the main principles guiding your thinking, please? and what's working so well so far and what's not working well okay main Big questions yeah. <laughs> main principles um so my main thing that's driving me as i just said is basically climate mitigation so i want to know that i'm sequestering carbon and i want to know that i'm reducing my emissions um, in a farming system as much as possible and I want to be able to be measuring that so we can kind of share that because I think agriculture has a huge role to play in like we're stuffed if we're just focused on adapting to climate because it's quite scary so I'm like ha and farmers manage such a huge landscape across Australia we need to be doing a lot more to reduce emissions so I reckon that's pretty much my motivation and then working back from there it's like well how do you do that and make a livelihood from it so you can kind of survive yeah that's it really <laughs> yeah is there anything that's worked um well or badly just in a very sh short uh, look snippet? yeah the like the doing the temporary fencing like spending so long to do the planning to to be able to put the permanent fencing in like, yeah, um, and then having to do the temporary fencing in, in the meantime and temporary kind of water and stuff and it's so much stuffing around and the labour intensity of that is annoying. So I reckon investing right up front in getting really good advice and getting the planning done so you can get that stuff um, in place. Um, I think this leads on nicely, um, if you don't mind, to Greg's next question, which he says, do you have a laneway system for shifting stock? So I assume that that's to do with fencing and infrastructure. Yeah. We plan to have a sort of semi-system where it's basically just from one end of the farm to the other, um, like 
along the ridge to to just when we need to bring stock quickly to the yards but not to have like extensive laneways everywhere between every single paddock so just kind of yeah a, a backbone basic um, and we'll put vegetation along there for kind of shade um, yeah thanks um, and we've got a question from Marissa so we've had a few questions today um, have you done soil tests and what is your pH, fertility, pK, organic carbon like? And I'm going to add to that, is that important to you? Yeah. So the acid, um, we had soil tests done a long time ago. We haven't done them recently except for just our own little. Um, yeah, acid soils is a problem. It's about five, like, but it's different in different parts of the farm. Um, and I don't know the others. No, we're about to invest in getting the carbon benchmarking so that um, later on we've got an option of getting soil carbon kind of credits. Um, yeah. Yeah, good one. Um, Marissa, there's, there's certainly lots to be said about um, soil tests and stuff. And um, it's interesting. I'm currently doing the holistic management course myself. and. Um, there's a whole nother gamut of conversation around those pH and fertility. So it's it's a really interesting pathway and I won't divulge into it now because there is another question from Tom. Um, does Serenity have a map plan of her farm, fencing, water, shelter plantings that she would be happy to share? Particularly interested in how your planting provides shade for multiple small paddocks and how fencing to protect the plantings was incorporated? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's a good question because it's really tricky. We do have a plan that's kind of iter iterative, but, yeah, it's like where do you, which side of the fence do you put your trees because you want to protect them with the fence in the first couple of years, but then after that you want the animals to be underneath them. So <laughs> we'll be protecting them temporarily. Anyway, yes, I can share that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was. But it is. It actually, yeah, it's quite a tricky thing with this planning of the of the shade trees and where they go in the paddock, like in terms of the behaviour of the animals and um, and how you protect them when they're establishing and all of that. Yeah. Have you found any better options than others, Serenity, in that? Uh, we'll probably just, <laughs> we'll be going to the permanent fencing for most of the fencing and then using temporary fencing again to be protecting vegetation as it's established. Yeah. Um, but also um, Rowan Reed, the agroforestry, you know, master, he, mm -hmm. he has a simple um, a guarding system for, uh, that's, that would be okay for sheep but not cattle. So if anybody's interested, I oh, will put Rowan Reed's um, details as well on an email out after the um, presentation as well. Yeah. I think we got through the, the majority of those. I, I just want to go back to Marissa and ask, was that um, valuable enough answer for you, Marissa? It's actually Nick here. Oh, sorry. Three of quick <laughs> about soil tests. Um, yeah, no, just interested. I, I know there's pH issues up there and you're interested in what organic carbon level you thought might be, you might be headed for, but you've obviously got to, you do, do need to measure before you can set those sort of targets, I guess. So, um, yeah. But do, do you have an idea of what your organic carbon levels are, um, Serenity? No. Uh, it'd be a good starting point because um, yeah. you've got limited, finite ability to increase it. And so if you're looking to sequester carbon for a carbon trading point of view. Yeah. I, I, I think um, we, like it's really tricky. Like I've read heaps of stuff on this and it's very hard in systems to be actually yeah, getting to a point where you can make any money out of the carbon credits. But we'll go through the benchmarking process and see how we go. Like there's, yeah. Look, there's also, there's two schools of thought on soil tests. Like 
there's people who in the kind of regenerative kind of space there's people who um do lots of testing and and use um you know uh um look at additives and all of that sort of stuff and then there's kind of we're following kind of graham and colin um in terms of just managing the grazing to eventually um even everything out yeah that's right there is um there is quite a quite an interesting um conversation around all of that stuff so yeah. thank you for, it's for very nice. that it's very hard to navigate. So they would say that even the acidity will um, correct itself over time and that's a very kind of controversial. I've been doing literature search on this. It's really, um, it's a really interesting kind of area. I can find stuff where there's um, tree planting has neutralised acidity over time because it um, supports the growth of the fungal networks which um, shifts the nutrients and, and shifts the acidity over time. But I can't find stuff on grasslands. Yeah, that that would be um, really interesting. Look, everyone, it's just after one o'clock. I've promised to finish the um, webinar at one. If you're interested in asking a, a Serenity a question offline afterwards, I'm sure she can hang around for another five minutes. Otherwise, um, thanks so much for joining. And the please fill out the link in the email that I sent earlier today or fill out the um Word document, that'd be great. Um, so we can make sure we're tapping into what people need. But also the Fraser Pogue from Ardmona is in hopefully in a couple of weeks. So when we find out when his video is done, then we'll um, certainly let you know. Thank you.